this is the first uh, meeting for launching the Biennale of Sydney. The art exhibition that will take place every two years and this year will be staged in this area from the third week in November up to the end of the year. We hope that the prestigious name of Biennale will be associated with the civil exhibition, with the tradition and the prominence. In the art world, there is the Biennale of Venice. Australia could then become really a meeting place in the art world for the Pacific area, blending tradition with the modern approach, understanding of a different races, uh, friendship, a meeting of people, basically what has been the purpose of our art prize so far and basically I think is uh, of any art uh, uh, convention. A brief eight months to establish a major art event. The Transfield Group of Companies announces the first Biennale of Sydney as a development of their long established art prize which has attracted the finest Australian painting and sculpture for the past decade. Now they, together with the Australian Council for the Arts, the New South Wales Government and the Department of Foreign Affairs, combine to get this international exhibition ready in time for its Opera House opening. As invitations to participate go out to artists in 15 countries, in Sydney's art quarter, Paddington, a series of coordinated designs is prepared for the event. In the Transfield Art Gallery, Robert North Sydney, surrounded by previous prize-winning paintings, the announcement of the artists participating in the Biennale is made by James Gleeson, the critic and writer. He and sculptor Ron Robertson Swan have selected 22 Australians. You will see, I think, from that list, that a wide range Franco Belgiorno Nettis, whose concept it is to hold the Biennale, meets some of the artists and critics. In the meantime, the Foreign Affairs Department is arranging for the work of the overseas contributors to be sent to Sydney. Five months to go. In Christchurch, New Zealand, a large canvas called Threshold 9 has been completed by William Sutton, one of two New Zealanders to be represented. While awaiting shipment, he works on other paintings. John Coburn is invited to design the poster. Two months to go, he gives his approval to the printing. Time now to set up the exhibition in the Opera House, to assemble the many and varied elements to form one cohesive style.
Minami Tada has come from Japan to put her exhibit together, a heavy glass and plastic construction called poles. She's helped by fellow sculptor Robertson Swan. them, pictures seem to glow from the dark walls in a setting designed by Robert Haynes. James Gleeson describes the paintings in this first Biennale of Sydney. Sydney Ball's earlier work was hard-edged, pure in colour and minimal. This painting is one that marks his return to a freer, more emotional and expressive style. Emil Schumacher represents Germany in the Biennale. William Sutton's painting has arrived safely from New Zealand. His threshold nine is basically abstract, but it has overtones of both a landscape and a spiritual or mental state. Colin McCann, another New Zealander, makes paintings out of texts or repeated words. The message is peripheral, the abstraction is central. So why is the Tantisuk comes from Thailand and his group dancing is both Western and Oriental in feeling. David Aspton, English born but living in Australia since 1950, is undoubtedly one of our finest colorists. Fred Williams is now by way of being an Australian classic. Of all our landscape painters, and we've been perhaps unusually prolific in this area, Williams has been the only artist able to make a virtue and aesthetic capital out of the monotony of the Australian bush. Gunter Christman, along with David Aston, represented Australia at the 11th Sao Paulo Biennale in 1972. Roger Kemp is also represented by two paintings, sequence one and sequence two. In both paintings, Kemp uses a, a characteristic device of building his paintings out of a strictly limited range of shapes, colors, gestures, and touches. John Olson is well represented with Captain Dobbin and Love in the Kitchen. I'm always inclined to think of Olson as a sort of visual Dylan Thomas, perhaps because he has the same warm interest in everything and everybody, and the same ability to pin down characteristics with a few well-chosen lines. You travel through an Olson, just as you travel through Thomas's Milkwood, on a journey of discovery. English painter and critic Patrick Heron is a world apart from Olsen. Antonio Pelez was born in Spain in 1921 but came to Mexico in 1936 and he represents Mexico in this Biennale. His interruption is aptly named. Karshena by Fred Kress is a straightforward lyrical abstract despite its enigmatic title and it's a very beautiful one. There is a radiance in it that suggests light and atmosphere and puts me in mind of those infinitely subtle and delicate skies in a Turner landscape.
Clifford Still represents the United States, and this very fine painting is characteristic of the style that made him one of the most justly famous painters of a modern American school. Kevin Connor is the purest of the Australian Expressionists, the most consistent and the most persistent, and probably the most potent. By mid-afternoon on Biennale Day, the main part of the show is ready and waiting. Korean sculptor Park Suk Won has used the qualities of aluminium to beautiful effect in this work, which he calls Handel Ancient Pile. And now, with the late afternoon sun streaming onto the opera house, the moment of truth is near. Guests arrive, passing at the entrance a welcoming sculpture by Robertson Swan. Yeran Days, June 73, days from Bangladesh. Clipal sculpture occupied the artist from 1965 to 1968, and it's one of the supreme works of Australian art, in my opinion. Solomon Suprid's work is comparatively traditional. Representing the Philippines, these two works in copper and bronze are expressions of emotional experiences in a manner that reaches back to the art of Rodin. Among guests invited from many parts is James Fitzsimmons, the editor and publisher of Art International, who lives in Switzerland. John Firth Smith's Embark shows that he has moved steadily from a fairly realistic form of landscape painting to an ever more abstract approach. In front of Firth Smith's canvas, we catch a glimpse of Robert Brown's Caro-esque Here to Here, but with Robert Jennon's first lesson, we turn to a very different kind of sculpture playful, funky, deliberately anti-traditional, and deliberately anti-mainstream. John Hopkins' realism is of a different kind again. In the more crowded of his two canvases, he follows the American Wynne Chamberlain in paying indirect homage to Manet's Déjeuner sur l'air. As in the work of most neorealists, you find the influence of the camera. No one has cast a more observant or a more caustic eye on some of our stranger tribal customs than John Brack of Melbourne. Roland Schlick's work is a conscious act of homage to Picasso and Matisse. Motives from both artists' works are combined in these very skillful reworkings of familiar themes.
Peter Powerditch is represented by three variations on a theme that has been central to his art for several years, the Sun Torso series. And finally, Joseph Tan of Malaya. The opening ceremony is to be performed by Prime Minister Whitlam. He's greeted by Franco Belgiorno Metis and Carlo Solteri, the joint managing directors of Transfield. All our thanks to the many people for their advice, for their guidance, encouragement, help. But the Biennale wish to acknowledge particularly the assistance of your government through the Australian Council for the Arts, the cooperation of the government of New South Wales, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and the Sydney Opera House Trust. We are fortunate in having you, Mr. Prime Minister, present for this first opening. May I ask you, sir, to declare this first Biennale of Sydney officially open? <laughs> Mr. Bell, John Onetis, Your Excellencies, Your Eminence, Mr. Attorney, Alderman Port, ladies and gentlemen, this is another first. The first Biennale of Sydney, the first art exhibition in the Sydney Opera House. Mr. Belgiorno Nettis, who did so much for art prizes when they were regarded as uh, an appropriate form of assistance by great corporations, by public spirited citizens to the art world, has given you the reasons why it is now more appropriate to have occasions like this where people are not competing but where they are in fact able to compare and uh, where they can encourage and where people can be inspired by their example at home and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen it is a, a matter of the greatest pleasure for me to, to declare this the first Biennale in Sydney officially open. And so the Biennale of Sydney is born. From such modest beginnings, traditions grow. And that's the aim of the Biennale of Sydney, to continue to present the finest art from Australia, the Pacific and the world.